room, I want you to have a superior attitude toward those that didn't show up this morning. You already, you already have a superior attitude? Fantastic. Um, I didn't know what to expect, but the crowd's a little smaller than normal, but I'm glad you're here. Uh, I started a tradition years ago, and I go in and out on, as to whether I make note of it, but this morning um, I was given a bulletin from someone who said they were in church last Sunday, and they were in the Bahamas in church, and I don't know if that even counts, but Zion Baptist Church was established in 1835 in the Bahamas, isn't that something? And it came out of the... Uh, Baptist Missionary Society out of London, and their bulletin is a book. It's all kinds of stuff. So, so anyway, if you're ever out of town and at visiting church, bring us a bulletin. Uh, we, Ferris and I, were out of town a couple of weeks ago when Lou was preaching, and we went to a church in uh, La Quinta. And in fact, um, the Corletos are moving to La Quinta, and it's their church. And I went to warn them about the Corletos. And the, you guys might want to think this through long and hard, but anyway. Um, good to be with you this morning, and Happy New Year. So let me pray for us, and we'll get started. <clears throat> Father, as we come before you this morning, as, as Jamie indicated, it is, it's odd that it is a new year. It's sort of a refresh for us. Um, ideally, we're focusing on you each day, and Christmas and Easter are not their special days, but they're every day for us because of our understanding of you and your truth of your word and what you've done for us. And so January 1st is a new day, but we approach it like the rest, and we're thankful that we can place our faith and trust in you as we look forward to a new year. I want to pray this morning for our government. I pray for our executive branch, uh, for the judicial branch, and for uh, the legislative branches of our national government, that as there is a transition of some sort taking place in the week. I pray you would oversee that. I pray you'd continue to grant us freedom and peace so that we as Christians can not live in a selfish fashion, but instead live with a proclamation of the gospel and that we would take advantage of the freedoms that you've given us. We pray for our state and local governments as well. Um, We recognize that you use these governments uh, for our benefit and good there are times when we would disagree with their decisions, and that's part of the republic in which we live. And so help us to be good citizens and uh, faithful to the things you've called us to do and to be. pray this morning as we look into your word that you would use my words to encourage us and uh, give us things to hang on to and apply in our lives. And uh, we think of those this morning that can't be in church, that are sick, or they're homebound, in prison. For differing in various reasons, they can't be in the fellowship of the, of the believers, and so we ask that you would encourage and strengthen them. Help us as a church to be more sensitive to those that need us, and uh, not to just be consumed with our own issues, but be looking out for the needs of others also. So we thank you uh, for our privilege of being together this morning, and we come in our Savior's name. Amen. Well, we are working through the book of Ephesians, and I believe this is my uh, 12th sermon in Ephesians, and we're in chapter, starting chapter 3, so don't do the math, but uh, we're in chapter 3, and this is a unique chapter. I'll I'll, uh, lay out a little bit, then read it, and then come back and make some observations, and then we'll have communion together. Uh, So verse 1 says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles... And then I don't know what your Bible has. My Bible has a long dash. Yours got something to indicate there's a change of thought here. And then, uh, so for this reason, is how it starts. Now look down at verse 14. For this reason, I now bow my knees before the Father. Here's what most believe. That Paul began to write out a prayer, and he got a verse into it. And then he realized, you know, there's some things I'm not certain the church in Ephesus fully understands yet. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause my prayer, and I'm going to give them 13 more verses of what I think they need to know. And so it, it's an odd, it you know, reads really roughly in English, really rough, roughly. <laughs> it's English. I, how would I know what it is supposed to be? For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles... 
If indeed you've heard the stewardship of God's grace, which has, was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. And by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles, prophets, in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light that which the administration of the mystery, which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things, in order that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through him in faith. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are for your glory. For this reason... I bow my knee before the Father. So he then enters into prayer. So you, you can view this as sort of a parenthesis. Paul enters in, he says, okay, I'm going to write a prayer. I get the impression from time to time that Paul's summing up a letter, and then he doesn't sum it up. And I, I think that's sort of what's happening here. He's, he's going to write out a prayer, and then he says, you know what, there are some things I want to make sure they understand. So I'm going to take a moment, express those things, and then I'll get back to my prayer later. Okay, so... That's why it reads a little rough in that front end, and I um, thought I'd just point that out, and then we'll walk through it. First thing I want to note here is, he says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. Now, if you, if you turn over to chapter 4, he says, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. So he's, uh, he's writing from prison. We know this. Uh, historians say that Paul spent five years in prison. Uh, he was unjustly uh, incarcerated. He was, accusations were made against him by Jews that were untrue, but that's what got him in trouble with the legal system in Rome. And uh, he appealed his way uh, through the legal system. And so he's sitting in a, in a jail right now or in a, a prison house, one or the other. And um, he's identifying himself as a prisoner of the Lord. Now, everything about his imprisonment is unjust or unjust. Um, and I'm guessing for a guy like Paul, I, I never have met him. I look forward to meeting him someday. But uh, he seems like a type A kind of guy to me. You know, he's, he's got a vision. He's got a plan. He's bright. He's uh, articulate. He's, he's a missionary. He's a church planter. He wants to teach doctrine and theology to the churches. He's got a lot of things he wants to do, but he's stuck in a prison. So I can imagine that there's a level of tension and anxiety in him that all of us would experience, but type A people would experience more. Um, and yet in the midst of that, he seems to be okay with it. He says, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Um, this week I got a phone call from a friend in prison. And he and his brother were convicted of a crime in 1994, and they were put in prison in 1995, and their sentence was life without parole. And uh, Grover is a good friend of mine, and he calls Ferris and I regularly. And, um, they've always maintained their innocence. It's a little hard for me to know, but um, they've maintained their innocence, even when it's been to their favor to, be, to claim guilt. Um, there comes a point in prison where if, if you actually acknowledge your crime, your odds of being paroled or released are better than if you don't. Uh, but they're, uh, they've proclaimed their innocence. And a year or two ago, there was a group called the Innocence Project that heard about them. They were in another prison in, in our state, and they were dealing with a prisoner there. And they said, have you ever heard about the Clegg brothers? And they said, no. And they said, well, you ought to look into the Clegg brothers because they're really uh, unjustly incarcerated. So they looked into the Clegg brothers. And uh, they then presented a petition, I'll use all the wrong terms for those of you that are lawyers, but they presented a petition to the governor asking her for clemency. And uh, on Thanksgiving Day, I believe, uh, I got a phone call, 
and Randall, given clemency, and Grover was not. So December 22nd, Randall exits the prison, and he's free, and Grover remains in prison. And uh, he called the other night, and he said, Pastor, I, I'm trying to figure out why I'm still here. What, what does this mean? What am I supposed to do? Why is, have I done something wrong? So all, kind, all the questions you can imagine you would have if you were in prison and, and dealing with these kinds of things. And I'm always at a bit of a loss to know how to best help him. I won't take that call. And this verse, quite frankly, is the one I told him. I said, you know, I'm teaching through Ephesians. Grover right now, it says, for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. I said, Paul was not a prisoner of Jesus. He was a prisoner of Rome, and he was put in prison on false charges and accusations. And yet he recognized and he chose to believe that he was in the sovereign guidance and hand of God. And I said, it's easy for me to say this, you know, from my home on Christmas Day. But Grover, that is true of you too. You're in prison and you need to view yourself as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. He has a purpose for you there. and it, it, Hopefully it will be short term. I mean, he's already done 27 years. But hopefully it will be short term. But if it's not... God's not forgotten you. You have a purpose, and you are a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And he, he, by faith, understands that and believes it. It's hard to process that. And, um, and I don't know where you are, what circumstance in your life you're experiencing right now, but if you have cancer, you're a cancer victim of Christ Jesus. He knows that. He's aware of that. He has not abandoned you. He's not forgotten you. He has a plan for your life. If, if you've lost a loved one, if you've lost a business, if you have gone bankrupt, if your children have gone astray, no matter what it is in your life that makes you feel alienated and isolated, whether it's just or unjust, God knows, and he's aware. And so my admonition to us and to me is when we find ourselves in these positions where we, we look at things and say, this just isn't right. Paul could have chosen to be pouty and said, I can't do anything. What's the point of writing letters to churches? But he said, no, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and he has me here, and he's got a purpose for my life. And one of those purposes was to write letters to churches so that you and I now can have the word of God in our hands and know God better. So I, I just I didn't want to pass right over that. I wanted us to recognize that Paul, despite his circumstances, continued to say, I belong to Jesus. Right now I'm a prisoner of Jesus. Before that I was a free man, but now I'm a prisoner. So I don't know where you are in your circumstances, but I would encourage us to claim I am I am Jesus's. I am Jesus's person in these circumstances, and he still has a plan for my life, and I want to be faithful to him no matter where he has me. Um, now, let's, let me summarize the parentheses. I'll, I'll look at verse 2. He says, Indeed, if you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief, and by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. So he's saying, in past generations, going all the way back to Adam, he said, there is a mystery that God chose not to reveal to his people, but he's now revealed it. And specifically, he says he's revealed it to me, the Apostle Paul, and to the apostles and the prophets. And he's, he's, and he's referred to this mystery already. He, he acknowledges that. He says, I've written about it in brief. And, but he's, he's wanting them to clearly understand what this mystery is. And so the next verse, he, he gets real clear. To be specific, here it is. Here's the mystery that's now been revealed. Gentiles are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus. 
Now, I mentioned this uh, a number of weeks ago when I taught through the end of chapter 2, that the division between Jew and Gentile in that day and age was stark and brutal. I mean, they did not like each other. They had never liked each other. God had been very clear with the Jewish nation in the Old Testament to stay separate from the Gentile world, and they did, and through that, they became very self-righteous about it, and they viewed Gentiles literally as dogs. So the idea of the church now being comprised of Jews and Gentiles is a tough pill for Jews to swallow. He's writing primarily to Gentiles right now, and I think he's writing to tell them, whatever you might hear from your Jewish brethren, you need to hear from me that you are co-heirs, you're co-equal, you're co-members of the body of Christ, that you are not a subclass of the body of Christ. Now, if you put this into historic perspective, historical perspective, God chose to, to bring salvation to the world through the nation of Israel, through the Jews of the Old Testament. And he engaged in promises with a number of different patriarchs throughout the years. You could go back all the way to Adam. Uh, he made a promise to Adam and Eve that someday he would bring a redeemer. And then to Noah after the flood, and then to Moses with the law, and then to David Uh, that someday there will be a king that will reign eternally on your throne. He had made promises to Israel that were specific to them that also had the ability to bless the world. But if you wanted to know God in the Old Testament, you you had to become a Jew. You had to go through the nation of Israel. So their understanding, a a Jew's understanding, even in the New Testament context now with the church, was... We are still number one. We're still God's blessed people. And to to incorporate Gentiles in the church would have been a real challenge for many of them. So Paul is wanting to put this concept, to put this prejudice to death, and he wants to make sure they understand the unity of the body of Christ. And um, so he pauses here to help us see this. So he says, Uh, Three things. First, that they're fellow heirs. So this is a legal term that they have all the same rights, all the same inheritance, that anything that a Jew has who is in Christ, a Gentile has as well. Secondly, they're fellow members of the body. So now instead of referring to the nation of Israel, he refers to the body of Christ, to, to the church. And Jews and Gentiles, now this makes up the whole world that's These are two religious cultural categories that embrace everybody. So Jews and Gentiles are fellow members of the body of Christ, and they are fellow partakers in the promises of Christ Jesus. So he gives us three layers in which there is no distinction, there is no difference, and he wants the church to understand that you have to set aside your prejudices. You can no longer entertain sort of your your disdain for one another, that's not allowable anymore. The church is to be different than the world. Um, The gospel makes the church a a safe place. Um, Because because we all come, well, here's how we look at verse 6 again. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. You see, the good news of the gospel is what unites us and brings us together in Christ. Uh, We we have a, a joint humility. The gospel can only be received by those who are humble. If if you think you can earn your way to God, if you think through your religious or moral activities that you have a standing before God, the gospel will be of no help to you. It'll be of no interest to you because you've not yet been humbled to the point to say, I need a savior. Uh, The gospel only is interesting to people who have spiritual poverty. When we recognize that we have nothing to offer a righteous God, then the gospel becomes very attractive to us. Until then, we see it as sort of a commodity that we don't need because we have something still that we can present to God. The gospel is for the people who are diseased spiritually and know it. They recognize that they've caught the disease. The disease will lead to death and judgment. 
the only cure for that disease is Jesus' finished work on the cross, and they believe that. And the gospel is for people who have been enslaved by the flesh. They have been held captive by their flesh to do the will of the flesh, or held captive by the culture to walk in the flow of the culture, and they are tired of it, they're sick of it, they want something different. And so through the gospel, both Jew and Gentile are united in the body of Christ and set free from that kind of thing. Um, A little more on the Grover story. Grover asked me a number of weeks ago if I knew anyone that had influence with the governor. And I thought, boy, he thinks more highly of me than he ought. (laughs) And uh, I I said, Grover, I really don't. I, I don't have any friends that would be influential with the governor or even if I don't have many of the same political persuasion as the governor and uh, and then a couple of weeks later I had an incident not an incident had an encounter here at church and I woke up that morning thinking about that encounter and I called this guy or I texted him and I said hey would you have any opportunity to have influence with the governor and he said actually I, I do and he said I I know the attorneys that are working on these clemency things so I sent him Grover's documents, which were hundreds of pages, and he read through them, and he wrote a letter to these men that are serving the governor. And I, I want to highlight one sentence out of that letter. Talk amongst yourselves. Uh, it was a beautifully written letter, and he said this. He said, also... I should mention that my pastor and I agree on basically nothing other than the tenets of our shared faith. (laughs) I get a little emotional over that. That's what the church should look and feel like. He and I are are wired differently politically. Um, We knew that. He knows that, obviously. He, He wrote it in the letter. When I read it, I, I thought, well, first it was sort of gutsy of him to send me a copy of the letter. <laughs> and I, I emailed him right back, and I quoted the quote, and I said something to this effect, that that really warms my heart, that we're able to set aside those kinds of things because of the unity we share in our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, that's a picture of what Paul is trying to get at here, in my opinion is that you, you're going to have a lot of dis- disagreements culturally between Jews and Gentiles. I mean, historically, it has been ugly. He says, you've got to set those aside. And you need to be united through the gospel around the Lord Jesus Christ in his body. So when I say the church should be the safest place in the world, what I mean is, is that, that the gospel unifies us and draws us together. And it's okay to have differing opinions about things in life and the world. And that that you should be safe with those opinions. And you should be safe with one another. And safe is sort of a modern term, but I I think you know what I mean. It'd be be like a family that, you know, my children may grow up and hold differing opinions than I do on certain things. And I'm going to continue to love them. They're going to be welcomed in my home. They're going to be safe there because, you know, in this case, we're family. In the church, it's because we're family. We're together. So a couple thoughts about the gospel in this regard. The gospel is the ultimate solution for the division and brokenness in the world. And, you know, I would say the last couple years, as I mentioned weeks ago, it's like the pinnacle of of division right now. Everybody's mad at everybody else, and everybody's got an opinion about everything. And there's a lot of opinions how we're supposed to solve this. Primarily, the solution is you should hold my opinion and not not yours. <laughs> That's what it always boils down to. And in fact, if you tell me your opinion, you're hurtful. You know, you're, you're hurting me. That's never going to solve anything. That's just going to divide us further and further apart. What solves this problem is the gospel. It solves it in the church, and, and here's the admonition. If, if it hasn't solved it for you in the church, you need to let it solve it for you. In other words, if there was a person that walked in of a different race, 
a different color, of a different nationality, of you know, and, and you were and you were uncomfortable with that. That's not right. The gospel solves that. We are united in Christ. That's probably not the biggest problem for us. I would guess if someone walks in and they were wearing a different political button than you're wearing, that might be a problem for you. And that's where we have to say, you know what? I can't let that be a divisive issue either. We are united in Christ. So that one little line in his email letter really warmed my heart that he and I understand our differences. He knows he's wrong, but no. We understand our differences, and yet we're saying, you know what unites us is our tenets, as he put it, the tenets of our faith, which we we know to be Jesus, and our common salvation through the gospel of Christ. So the gospel unifies the church, and it should, and if it hasn't, we have to work on that, but the gospel also unifies us with the world. If, if we can't see as followers of Christ that Israel is no longer the solution to God's bringing the, the message of salvation to the world, the church now is, and if we as a church say, well, we'll take it to those people and those people, but I don't have the stomach to take it to those people, we have missed what God has called us to do and to be. We are to be gospel proclaimers wherever we go. A church that thinks about the needs of the world, the needs of the community, the needs of the world, and doesn't allow racial barriers or social barriers or economic barriers to keep us from going where the gospel needs to go is the church that adequately reflects beautifully the heart of God. And so we as a church need to be united in, uh, inside with one another and not allow differences to separate us and to cling to the gospel, which we all were brought together through. And we need to be a church that's united out there, that, that, that doesn't hold the world at arm's length because we don't like them, because we don't like what they believe, what they stand for, this, that, or the other. Um, we've got to get over that. And I, I believe this section, well, well the whole Bible, but this section of Ephesians, Paul is saying, before I pray for you, you need to understand this. You cannot live separated and divided as Jews and Gentiles. And I would say we need to understand this in the church as well. We can't can't just pick those that are like us and say, okay, we're all good now. That's not how this works. We have to take the gospel to the world. Okay. Uh, Let me draw a couple of conclusions about Paul's perspective and um, look at verse 7. So first he says, okay, there's this mystery. It's that Jews and Gentiles are one. Gentiles have everything that a Jew has in the context of the church. The mystery was hidden. In fact, if you go back, um, the prophets of old didn't look forward and say, someday there's going to be a church. (laughs) That, That whole concept, they have no idea on that. Um, he says it was hidden, but now it's been revealed. Here's what it is. There is a church, and the church is combined of Jews and Gentiles. And he said it was, it was given to me and to the apostles and the prophets. And I was in verse 7. Uh, Through the gospel of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power, to me the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light uh, what is the administration of the mystery for ages that has been hidden in God who created all things. So let me stop there. What do we learn about Paul's perspective? First, he tells us he's a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he is content in the circumstances that God has placed him in. Um, That's a model for us. We should be content where God has placed us. Uh, We don't maybe enjoy them, but we have to stop and recognize that, God, you are sovereign in our life, in my life, and I'm going to do the best I can as I deal with this sickness or deal with this issue or, in my friend's case, live in Oregon State Penitentiary. Uh, Secondly, he says, now I'm a minister in verse 7. I've been made a minister according to the gift of God's grace. That word minister could also be translated servant. 
Um, and this is a really, I think, a good pattern for us to understand that if we are going to be ministers, both in the practical sense as we take the gospel to the world around us and in the official sense of a minister or a pastor in a pulpit, um, the first aspect of our calling isn't power, it's not prestige, it's not authority, it's servanthood. And we are called to be servants, and who do we serve? We serve the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our master. He is our Lord. And when we, when we look to him and get our directions from him and, and our marching orders from him, then we can accomplish what it is that he set out before us, both individually and corporately as a church. So we are prisoners and we are servants. It's not starting off real great here. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus and to be uh, proclaiming his gospel. Now, a servant uh, is confirmed by character, or a minister is confirmed by character. Um, turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 3. I, I read this passage just a couple of weeks ago when we um, commissioned James as an elder. But this is the character that the minister is to have. Verse 1 of 1 Timothy chapter 3, it's a trustworthy statement. If a, if a man aspires to the office of overseer or deacon, uh, or, oh, excuse me, overseer or elder, it's a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, but gentle, uncontentious, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert, lest he become conceited and fall into condemnation incurred by the devil. He must have a good reputation with those outside the church, so that he may not fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. So a minister is known by his character. And uh, we are servants of Christ, and as servants, that's the character that we're to have. But a minister is also known uh, by his gifting. Take a look at what Paul says here. I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me. Now, I, I, we've sort of, in our culture, I think, gotten things a little bit backwards. We tend to look at education first. Okay, where did the guy go to school? Where did he go to seminary? Is he well-educated? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm all for education. But really, what we should look for first is, does he have a character that would be in pursuit of God? Does he have a character that God would go, yes, I put my mark of approval on him? And secondly, is he gifted to do what the church is calling him to do? And Paul is... He doesn't mean, and Paul was highly educated, but what he's highlighting here is, is character and gifting. And uh, so Paul recognizes that servanthood is the, the driving motivation of the minister, and the minister then needs to not only have the character to accomplish that, but the gifting to do that as well. And then lastly, he says this. He says, to me... The very least of all saints, this, was, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and bring to light what is the administration of the mystery for ages, which has been hidden in the past. I'll skip through that. Um, the next thing Paul says, I'm a prisoner. I'm a servant. And he, it's odd to have him say it, but he says, I'm the least of all saints. He has, he has a growing humility. If you look at Paul's life, if you won't, don't need to turn there, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9, he says this. He says, I am the least of the apostles, not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. So early on, he's been chosen by Jesus as an apostle, but he tells the Corinthians, he says, listen, of all the apostles, I'm the least because I was killing Christians. These other men weren't doing that. I was. So he takes a humble position amongst the 12. Then today, in Ephesians, he says, listen, I'm the least of all saints. Um, he, he says, of all the believers and Christians that are and ever will be, I'm, I'm the least of those. And then in 1 Timothy, at the end of his life, he says this. 
This is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am the foremost of all. So early in his ministry, he says, I'm the least of the apostles. As he understands himself better, he then says, I'm the least of all saints. And as he understands God even better in his own failings, he goes, I'm the greatest of all sinners. Folks, that's the pattern that should be ours in our lives. Not a, not a made-up humility, but a humility based on the deeper I go with God, the shallower I understand I am. The deeper I go with God, the more I see my sin. I, I think I've used this example before, but when, when you first get married, you think you're a pretty good spouse. The longer you stay married, you recognize, yikes, maybe not Maybe not God's gift to my wife like I thought I was. That's, that's a healthy process that we understand, okay, there are some issues in my life that have been revealed through this intimate relationship with one that God has given me. It's a healthy process for Christians to go, there are issues in my life that have been revealed because of my deepening relationship with Christ. The more I understand the scriptures, the more I see my own motives, the more I see things that are happening in my heart and life, man, I am a sinner in need of a Savior. And you see that progression in the Apostle Paul. Do people see it in you and do they see it in me? Are you coming to this conclusion that I desperately need a Savior, I need the gospel? There is no room for me to be prejudicial toward other people. There is no room for me to be judgmental toward other people. I need the gospel. And then the last thing that I find really interesting is this. Um, let's see. Verse 10. He says, well, starting in 9. To bring to light what is the administration of the mystery. In other words, how God did things in the past is not how he's doing things now. God has not changed. His plan has, or his 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 methods have. What he did through Israel, he now does through the church. That's, that's this uh, administration. He says, in order that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known uh, through the church to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. How you and I, as the church, do life together, proclaim the gospel, live in peace and harmony without prejudice, how we do that is actually proclaiming God's glory to demons. Angels too, but to demons as well. You see, angels, they could read the Bible and they assume, I assume they knew the the Old Testament. And they didn't have a clue about the church. They weren't able to see what God was, where he was going. And he's saying now, they, in fact, <laughs> he's saying the way the church responds to God gives God manifest glory. And demons go, whoa, wait a second. These people get along. These people love one another. That's not our plan. That was not our plan at all. And I want, us to, I want us to raise our sights a little bit here to say it's not just that we can live more comfortably together if we choose to live in harmony. It's not just that we could be more effective at the outreach of the gospel in our community and around the world if we live in harmony. It's that we actually are God's way of showing demons and Satan and the fallen world that he is to be praised and the glory of the church goes to him. Pretty astounding thing that a few hundred of us here on Cal Young, as we come together, we proclaim to the demonic world that God is God, that his glory is his, and that how we work together brings him great 
Um, today we have the opportunity of serving communion. Gentlemen, if you wanted to head that direction and Lou uh, bring the team up. And we just had communion a couple of weeks ago. I, Ferris and I weren't here to enjoy it, but um, we wanted to do it today to kick off a new year and recognize that we uh, want to want to set our sights appropriately as to what God has called us to do. Uh, if you're new to our church, communion is an ordinance, not a sacrament. What that means is it does not impart grace. It doesn't save you. God doesn't love you more if you take communion. Communion was given to us, or the Lord's table was given to us by Jesus himself. On the night in which he was betrayed, he was with his disciples in the upper room, and he broke the bread, and they took the cup, and uh, um, said this. And the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we gather together to do that. So if you're a follower of Jesus, if you have placed your faith in him and him alone uh, for the salvation of your soul through the finished work on the cross, if you have embraced the gospel, you're welcome to take communion with us. If you've yet to do that, if you're investigating Christ or you've, you've reached a thought-through conclusion that, no, I'm not, I'm not going to believe that, communion would not be appropriate. Um, it, it just wouldn't be because it's us saying we believe in his death, his burial, his resurrection, his shed blood on our behalf. Um, for the rest of the body, for... for for us, uh, I'd like us to think about communion today in the context of <clears throat> our internal embracing of the gospel and the unity that that brings us in the church and our external proclamation of the gospel and the unity that brings us toward people who are not like us, that we will not allow barriers to keep us from going where God has called us to go our artificial human barriers, we, we will overlook those and we will take the gospel where it needs to be. So let's enjoy communion together. Let me pray for us. Father, we're grateful that we're reminded yet again today that you sent your son to live human flesh in perfect submission to your will and under the law. And that unjustly he was accused and he was tried, he was convicted, he was crucified. But you didn't allow it to end there. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you resurrected him from the dead, proclaiming that he not only is the Son of God, but that what he did for us was sufficient to forgive our sins. So we have believed that, and today we remember that as we take supper together. Lord, we are humbled by our helplessness. We are blessed by your grace. And we're awed that you can use us to proclaim your majesty to the world around us. We love you and we come in Jesus.